Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Foresight's uh, Space Group. I'm really, really happy to be joined here by Fionn and by Tanya. Um, I think, you know, uh, as we, I guess, already just said before we started recording, but I just want to reiterate that, right? Like, I think one thing that makes this group special is that, um, you know, everyone here really uh, should, be, uh, should be interviewed and will be at some point if you're open to it and want to. And uh, this is really a group of people that work in the space industry, that do research in the space industry, can come together and talk a little bit about the things uh, that they, maybe they would always like to speak about, but there's never really quite the venue or the opportunity to do so. And it's really about trying to figure out like a few more um, points of action and collaboration for more long-term projects and bits that maybe uh, sometimes fall, um, yeah, fall, uh, fall off the agenda and in, in everyday life. And so this can be a little bit more exploratory than maybe the normal, uh, I think, day-to-day -day conversations that you're used to. Um, and yeah, it's been happy to have Fionn here and I can recommend it. Tanya as a guest. Thank you so, so much, Tanya, for joining um, uh, and uh, for writing this fantastic book. Um, I'm definitely going to drill you about that in the Q&A, but for now, I want to let Fionn take it away. And this is just, again, for me, another reminder for everyone in this group to ask a bunch of questions, uh, to comment uh, a lot on uh, on the work, and we're trying to have, have it as open uh, as possible. Okay, wonderful. Fionn, take it away. All right. So uh, first of all, I have had the pleasure of working with Tanya for, I don't know how many years now, five, something like that. Um, yes, I've been at Planet for three years, like officially, and then like hanging around Planet, trying to get you guys to hire me for like three more years before that. <laughs> five or six years. And we also know each other socially through some mutual friends. And, um, but I haven't worked with her closely and I've certainly never been involved. She and I haven't been involved at this level of uh, direct conversation. So this will be fun. Um, Tanya is an example of this like vast reservoir of interesting pe space people I can call upon from planet. Uh, and I'm trying to not keep this group like totally biased towards planet people, but, but you know, we're, we're going to give them the cream of the crop. And so we start with Tanya. Um, anyway, um, so Tanya, perhaps you could first tell us a little bit about like your academic background. I know you have a PhD. Where is it from? What was it about? And how did you move from that? Or how did you get inspired to that? How did you move from that to, I guess, you've had hundreds of publications, mostly about Mars, but there's going to be some other things too. And then you went and concentrated on the Earth, a planet. So maybe you could outline your, your journey in like five minutes or so. Well, five minutes, that's really hard. My journey's been kind of all over the place. So I started out as an astronomer because when I went to college, I was like, planets are in space. I should be an astronomer. And then didn't realize that if I wanted to study Mars, I actually should have been a geologist. But I didn't want to give the University of Washington any more money to stick around an extra year to switch my major. So I finished degrees in astronomy and physics, um, published a paper on metal content of recurring Novi systems. So that was actually my first thing. It was not Mars. Um, I made a cool discovery, like as an undergrad, that uh, recurring Novi systems are enriched in lithium compared to non-recurring systems. I don't remember the significance of that, but at the time I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, so then in grad school, I switched to geology so I could focus on Mars. And uh, my, my goal ever since I was like 11 when Pathfinder landed was, I really want to work on Mars rovers. I think Sojourner is just the coolest thing ever. So I had this very singular focus. Um, after I did my master's, uh, my grad school experience was not great. So I decided to leave and go work in industry for a while. So I ended up working for a company that has built most of the cameras that have ever gone to Mars and some cameras for some other missions as well. Was that um, Malin? Yes. <laughs> um, so I worked for Malin for about four years, uh, working in science and mission operations for the context camera and the Mars color imager on Mars Constance Orbiter, and then um, Molly, Mascam, and Marty on Curiosity. Uh, and then some stuff for, that became Mascam Z that's now on Perseverance uh, and some Juno stuff. Because Juno is basically like the Mars descent imager that we had on Curiosity, but sent it to Jupiter instead. Um, and while I was there, I had told the chief engineer that my goal was to be like the principal investigator of a mission. And he said, well, it might be easier if you get a PhD to do that because you're not an engineer, you're a scientist. And the, the road will be a little bit more difficult if you don't have one. Um, so between that and some other factors, I decided to leave and go back and get a PhD. So I went to the University of Western Ontario in Canada, which at that point had, had Canada's only graduate program in planetary science for a PhD. Um, and I focused there on 
Martian gully systems because while I was working at Malin, part of my job was actually to monitor about 700 individual sites to see if the gullies were changing because Malin was the one that discovered that gullies on Mars were active. And this was um, a hint that maybe there was liquid water active on the surface of Mars today back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and so through that, I got really interested in gullies. And so I took the work that I had done from Malin and I kind of expanded upon that in my PhD. So I became known as the gully girl in the Mars community because I mapped out every gully on the entire surface of Mars manually. Um, because while working on the context camera on CTX, my job was to take pictures of the whole planet every day. Um, between that sounds, and Mars. Sounds familiar. Yeah, I thought it was cool that we could image the whole world every day. Um, so around the time that I was finishing my PhD, I got a call out of the blue from Arizona State University offering me a job with this new space initiative they had where they wanted somebody that had industry experience or interest. Um, they didn't really go down, want to go down the tenure track faculty position. And so um, someone had recommended me because they knew that my goal was not to get a PhD and then go back and be a professor. I, I was intending to like not go back to Maryland, but probably go to JPL and work in mission operations there. Um, the person that recommended me for the job said, this would be a really good way for you to survey the whole space industry and figure out where you might want to work. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. And I co-taught a class there called Commercial Opportunities in Space, where we'd bring in people from different new space companies to talk about what the company did and their own career paths. And I think one of the engineers from Planet was like the first or second person we brought into that class the first semester I worked there. Um, I, unfortunately, I can't remember what his name was, Creon, but he's, I know he's not there anymore. But this was back in the days when like Planet was so small, they closed for Burning Man, <laughs> like it's a company holiday. I think the company was like 30 people. Um, and this guy was talking about how this company wanted to image the whole world every day to look for change. And I was like, that's my job on Mars, but someone's doing it on Earth. And the company seemed really cool. But I was like, my expertise is in Martian landslides. Like, how am I getting a job in an Earth observing satellite company? So, I. Uh, I basically just tried to network with a bunch of people at Planet. I applied for a few jobs that I didn't get. Um, I think because they probably saw that I was an engineer and was just like, ah, this is not relevant. Um, so I was like, well, if I meet enough people, I can convince them that the experience that I have in satellite image interpretation, in satellite operations, in cameras, stuff like that, maybe that is transferable enough that they'll want to hire me. And then eventually uh, I got a job at Planet three years ago. <laughs> and so now I do um, all of our strategic partnerships and messaging and engagement toward the global research community to help them understand that planet data, data is available to them and how they can use it in their research. And then sometimes I still get to do some research on my own, but it's not a big part of my, my job anymore. Right. right and I should, I should mention one thing about that since I'm also at planet, uh, the education and research program, which, which Tanya is uh, talking about has the, like planet has a lot of customers. The majority of them are from the education and research program. It doesn't represent the majority of dollars that we earn from customers, but it certainly represents the majority of customers and the majority, if not the overwhelming majority of publications that come about using planet data. Isn't that correct? Absolutely. Between education and research and then the rest of the science programs we have, like through um, an agreement with NASA, um, an agreement with the Norway International Climate and Forest Initiative, ESA EarthNet and an agreement with the um, German space agency called the Rapid Eye Science Archive. We've got over 2000 publications from folks using our data over the last uh, little less than a decade. And then, um, yeah, I don't know if we are allowed to say the exact percentage, but the vast majority of registered users of planted data come from those science programs, which is pretty amazing to see. Yeah, this has parallels to some of the early stuff that happened with software where um, Places like Bell Labs and Berkeley gave away Unix, an early predecessor to Linux at cost or free to education and research people and produced a whole generation of people that only wanted to use that operating system. So it eventually ended up uh, allowing them to penetrate industry and uh, enterprise stuff. I don't know if that was deliberate, but it ended up being that way. So maybe that'll also happen with Planet Data. All these people will graduate and some of them will get jobs in the industry and they will, they will want um, to use planet data. Okay. So pasty. So, um, uh, let's see. So I want to go back to Mars for a moment, if you don't mind, cause you, you were really 
into this question of water on Mars, but unlike so much of JPL, and by the way, did you ever work at JPL? Not directly. No, I just worked for Malin as a subcontractor. Okay. Well, nonetheless, um, so you're more interested in, in the possibility of, of current liquid water flowing on Mars. What do you think? Is it, a, is it a slam dunk, like a closed case that these gullies have liquid water flowing in them, or could it possibly be something else? Like some of these more exotic things like carbon dioxide or, or wind or whatever. So I think if you ask most of the people in the gully community, they're very heavily leaning toward the water story because there's just certain aspects to the morphology of the, the channels themselves that are in these gullies that don't really lend themselves toward being carved by some kind of dry avalanche. Um, really early on, one paper proposed that these were carved by releases of like liquid carbon dioxide, but thermodynamically, that just doesn't make sense for Mars. There is a little bit of a debate though between how the gullies formed initially versus what is happening in those gullies today. So if you look at things like the general shape of the channels and the deposits from the, the gullies kind of in their early stages of formation, it's pretty much a slam dunk that there had to have been water involved in some capacity, even if it was just a small percentage that's enough to turn it from like a dry landslide into like a debris flow, which could be, you know, okay. to, to so, so good in that. I'm going to first ask a scientific engineering mission design question, and then I'm going to turn it political and a little bit controversial. So, okay. and I'm, and I'm going to also say that if, if Carol Stoker or Larry Lemke want to chime in and help answer this question, that would be fine. So first, what, like, do we have anything on the books? And if, and if, and in any case, why aren't we targeting one of these gully fans or whatever the flat place which is feasible to land in because we probably can't land in the gully like why aren't we going there and looking for live evidence of liquid water so it pretty much boils down to planetary protection like for perseverance for example we specifically had the goal of looking for signs of ancient life because it gets around a lot of planetary protection issues of well if this is a place where there could be liquid water today maybe there's something alive there um that's actually probably the most significant thing that came out of my PhD is I created this map of where all the gullies were on Mars. And then, um, why am I blanking on his name? Someone at JPL in the Mars office came and asked for the map. And then they said, okay, all of these are now like planetary protection sites. So you can't land at any of these 5,500 different okay, locations. Okay, so that, in that will lead into the politically controversial question, which I'll ask later. Uh, uh, Kara or Larry, do you have anything to say about that same thing? Um, so are we talking about gullies or are we talking about recurring slope linear? Cause they're different. Yeah. And right now we're talking about gullies. Cause the gullies are, um, maybe less compelling evidence of liquid water than the recurring slope linear. What is that latter thing? Well, these are things that are, I mean, maybe you should answer since you're the probably more of an expert than I. <laughs> I'm so, sorry, yeah. Oh, no worries. So um, recurring slope linear are these, these features that we see that incrementally grow on certain slopes on Mars in the warmest parts of the year. And they, they grow and they darken and then they kind of stop and they'll fade away. So they look very different from um, like dust avalanches that we've seen in other places that are dark streaks that form very rapidly and then fade away much more gradually as more dust deposits on top of them. The original thought for those that I think most people still hold on to is that they could be really, really briny flows of water. Um, the source of the water is still up for debate. So in terms of liquid water on the surface of Mars today, our cells are definitely, recurring slope linear are definitely much more compelling um, than the gullies where the gullies, they were probably carved by something involving liquid water in the last few hundred thousand to few million years, uh, depending on where you are on the planet. Um, but the activity that's happening inside those gullies today, that's a little bit more debatable about whether that might involve water or frost lubrication or dry landslides that are occurring in this pre-existing channel. Okay, that so, so this are. planetary protection thing is, you know, it comes up a lot and we'll return to that mo momentarily, but I want to ask you and also perhaps Larry and Carol, if they want to chime in, what about the idea of sending something like that little helicopter or some follow on to that, an airplane or a balloon or something like that? where you can get up close to the gullies, but you're not going to contaminate them by landing. Is that acceptable to the planetary projection community? Could I add? Yep. 
we proposed that about 10 or 12 years ago. Exactly that. Using, using a helicopter to go and explore the, the uh, recurring well, flow. Usually, Larry, my experience has been when you and NASA aims to post stuff like that, it gets rejected because it's not expensive enough. But why was it rejected? <laughs> well, at that time, I mean, that was before anybody had flown anything heavier than air on Mars. And so it was still, I consider, you know, uh, you know, risky. Uh, but also, you, you know, you, uh, it, it's, it's not enough with the NASA, as you know, to just simply have a good idea for some investigation you might do. There, there ultimately has to be some, uh, some hole in the program that that fits, that that fills, right? There has to be an opportunity to propose that kind of a thing. And, uh, it, it to, and, and if you look at the, you know, the recent helicopter flight, that was basically very similar to the, the 97, you know, path fighter mission where it was added on as a small incremental technology development experiment. Right. It didn't on, even on a mission that was already approved, right? It didn't really even have that many science goals, I would imagine. Well, right. In fact, in fact, they can't actually say that because then you would have to go through the science period, right? So that's why a technology development mission is yeah. Was the serendip life. serendipitous discoveries are always possible. Anyway, that's that's good to know. Now the controversial part, getting back to planetary protection. And I and I'm uh, hopefully there's no one from JPL on here, or maybe hopefully there is someone who could who could uh, you know set me right and contradict me on this. I have certain odd friends who are also very interested in Mars and have published on it, but maybe some a little bit outside the mainstream, a little bit heretical stuff. And they say that this planetary protection thing is kind of a big racket, and we might look at uh, whatever it was was it Phoenix, the thing that landed near the poles and actually found evidence of liquid water condensing on the legs of the lander and, and plenty of ice that it scraped into right underneath. And one might argue, you know, okay, now the planet's been contaminated, I guess, as well with the Vikings. But um, what I want to know is like, to what extent is JPL, A, because they're geologists and planetary scientists mostly, and B, because if, if liquid water and even life, is, extant life is discovered, it's like all of a sudden it's no longer JPL's planet anymore and they have to share it. Um, is there any truth to that? Or do you think that's just like a paranoia on our part? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of JPL in many ways, but, <clears throat> but I, I think that's a complete misunderstanding of the whole planetary protection process. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the planetary protection process doesn't come from JPL. Um, they have requirements imposed on them and they have to meet those requirements. Um, the, um, the planetary protection protocols really come from an international um, agreement, basically a um, a treaty. Think of it as a treaty. I don't think it's it's actually as formalized as a treaty, but it is managed <clears throat> managed by COSPAR, which is the Committee on Space Research. They have an annual meeting. You've probably heard of them. Is that a um, committee? The Committee on Space Research, COSPAR. Um, and the, uh, the planetary protection office has been a office inside of the science mission directorate, but it has now been moved out of there and it's been put into, I, I believe the chief engineer's office. And it is actually some of the, um, rigor has been relaxed and it's being relaxed in the recognition that there is, uh, you know, the very high probability that we're going to be putting people on Mars in the next decade or two, and that people are going to contaminate Mars. Um, now, I personally have been advocating that we need to do robotic mission to search for extant life in uh, plausible, habitable environments before we start landing people. But right now, it is a, uh, a centralized in headquarters. A uh, set of requirements that are that are uh, imposed on any mission uh, from, you know, the top down. So JPL is simply a um, uh, an acceptor of those requirements. Okay, thanks for that. That's some um, good stuff to know. Um, okay, back to Tanya. One more question. So Mars, 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 and now Earth, Earth, Earth. Are you happy about this? I mean, I know it's a nice. To work in a planet is nice for many reasons, 
do you, have you become like earth focused now? I mean, obviously your hair is from Mars, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, um, like how is it to sort of have turned your focus from Mars to the earth? How does that both personally affect you as well as professionally? What do you think? It's, it feels very strange to have built, like to have worked really hard to build a career and a specialization in something literally on an entire, entirely different planet. And then kind of leave all that behind to do something new. It was like coming to earth felt like a huge, I don't know, like I felt massive imposter syndrome because I hadn't really done any work on earth other than you know, I did some Mars analog work in Devon Island uh, in the Canadian high Arctic and a very long time ago, some stuff in Antarctica, but I wasn't used to looking at anything involving trees or humans or oceans. Like that just wasn't anything that I really paid much attention to. And so now that I work in, in a position where I have to know about like agriculture and marine pollution and, you know, human infrastructure, it, it's uh, learning new stuff, which is interesting. But there's also this, um, if you tell somebody you work on the Mars rovers, like anybody, wherever you are, like getting your hair done, riding in an Uber, like meeting someone for drinks, the reaction is usually like, wow, that's so cool. Tell me more. If you tell somebody that you work for an Earth Observing Satellite Company, unless they're a space person and they're like, oh man, you work at Planet, that's really cool. <laughs> like in general, the general public is like not quite as excited about Earth Observing Satellites compared to Mars rovers. And that that does have some kind of weird effect of like, oh, I feel less cool than I used to be, which sounds so dumb, but- right. um, Well, just, yeah, for I, just for reference, you're still considered one of the coolest people at Planet. So, you know, <laughs> that's an upside. Um, okay. so. Next question, uh, which has to do again with planet and Mars. And I think, uh, Larry, since you've spent a lot of time working at planet in the past, maybe you might also, um, have something to say about this. What do you think about the possibilities of planet labs sending stuff to Mars? Like you, time, you know, you know, Pelican, which has been publicly announced to some extent and, and fidelity, the hyperspectral mission to some extent, do you think that, and even the SAR systems that we've worked on in the past, do you think there's any any juice or any, like any benefit to planet, not financial benefit, but like scientific benefit to deploying that kind of technology to Mars, if it was possible, cause it's a very different environment, obviously in low earth orbit, or do you think that we should just leave Mars to the uh, professionals? I mean, selfishly, I would love us to send stuff to Mars because uh, it would be a cool way to merge both of my interests, but from a scientific standpoint, without my bias, well, you have a very, um, slanted view of Mars in terms of like the time of day of the orbit of most of the satellites that we've ever sent there, um, the resolution limits of data that we have. And we, we don't get a lot of high cadence repeat coverage at anything higher than like Marcy resolution, which is about one kilometer. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see what kind of new dynamics we would understand about Mars on sort of the day-to-day -day basis if we had this repeat high temporal and high frequency resolution coverage. It might give us a lot more information about things like the RSLs and how they're growing and changing over time. Um, we might be able to catch more um, changes on the surface, like maybe we'll see gully activity in more places because we can monitor all of them at a a higher rate. When I was monitoring them with CTX, we want image them basically once every four months if we were lucky, just because and, of that. What was that? What's the resolution on CTX? Uh, it's six meters. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good, but it took us 10 years to mosaic the entire planet at six meter resolution. Whereas, you know, planets getting daily coverage at, well, <laughs> five ish meter resolution. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right, Larry, you have something to add? Yeah. Uh, so, um, the, I, I, I so the, I guess the, the most general version of your question is could a company like planet play in, you know, planetary exploration where the planet involved is not earth, but, you know, Mars or maybe the moon or, you know, whatever. Um, my answer from a sort of technical standpoint, hell yes. Um, but, 
but it would require, in my opinion, uh, a, a company like Planet to sort of re re envision in its its role. Um, in general, when I before I came to Planet, uh, whether that was five or six years ago, um, from the outside, Planet uh, Planet Labs, as we called it, was uh, was considered an exemplar of you know new space uh, or or agile space, as it was often often called. Yeah, uh, which was, you know, as viewed from the outside, from let's say the government or other commercial entities, um, the 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 interesting and relevant thing about a company like Planet was, um, you you could start from nothing, you know, literally six guys in a garage in Cupertino that cobbled together a prototype of something, and then within a few years you could be flying, you know. 10 in and then 50 and then, you know, a hundred and so forth of these things in a very, very, uh, uh, dynamic, fast moving spoke works type of operation. Um, I, uh, and I think many other people kind of envisioned that a company like that would, would sort of naturally take that entrepreneurial, you know, fast paced development culture and apply it to other targets. Uh, so far, I, you know, that has not been the case for Planet. Yeah, well, part of the reason that has not been the case is because Planet tries to get these missions that are kind of at the, at these, create these things that are at the, have an intersection of users, science, science users, commercial users, and government users, right. just from science, like defense and intelligence or things like that. And, and there's not a whole lot of commercial users for, for, for well, sure. I understood. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not actually criticizing. I'm just saying that that's, that was kind of a, a description of the, of the case, but, but so, so what I see is the, as kind of the frontier where, where companies like a planet, you know, maybe not planet exactly, but a company with that same sort of culture and, and, and uh, spirit is in, in utilizing, you know, the, the next generational launch capability that's, that's going to come along. Um, as some of you probably know about, uh, 10 or 12, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I, I see that John Karch is, is on, or at least was, um, we, you know, we came up with this idea of, uh, could you use, could you use the dragon, the SpaceX dragon capsule to land science payloads on Mars? Because at that time it was basically still using retro propulsion and, and so forth. So we, you know, so we cranked up this big study that we did jointly with SpaceX and after, you know, several years came to the conclusion, yes, you could, there's no technical reason you couldn't take, um, you know, at the a dragon capsule, uh, which at the time we called the red dragon and actually, and actually fly to Mars and landed on Mars and you'd have multiple tons of payload. Well, at the time, if you looked at, at the NASA Mars science program, um, and, and all the science and investigations and instruments that they wanted to fly, um, several tons of payload would have exhausted the next 30 years of the, of the NASA Mars science program and probably cost $10 billion to develop, right? So it was pretty clear that, that the, the, the launch and landing capability to get stuff to Mars was even at that time was rapidly outpacing our ability to develop the payloads to utilize that capability. And if, and if, and if Starship goes forward and I, I, I'm betting a will, uh, it's going to be even worse. You know, I mean, from that standpoint, you get, you got a hundred tons of payload you can get to Mars. So, um, nobody knows how to, or 50, whatever the number is, right? Nobody knows how to develop, you know, tens of tons of science or exploration payload to another planet and make it affordable and do it in a, you know, fast turnaround. So to me, that is the challenge. And, and yes, I think, you know, organizations like planet could have a role in that. My guess is, you know, planet would not step up to developing the entire hundred tons, but you could certainly develop, you know, payloads. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we might, and we might. Can I, can I bring up something else? Of course. Um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe planet would be better off looking at the moon than Mars. Um, because for the moon, you know, there's opportunities right now. Um, there is, uh, the whole, uh, competed lunar lander program, the CLIPS program. And, um, there are many companies that are uh, proposing to develop and fly and are getting selected to develop and fly landers to the moon uh, and payloads on those landers to the moon. Instrument payloads and, and um, you know, other things, could be other things. In, in situ resource utilization relevant payloads. Um, and those opportunities are happening twice a year. Like- yeah. That's, that's good stuff. I want to ask if, if John Karsh is actually uh, active, if he has anything to add about Red Dragon before we move on. All right. And well, by the way, John just took a job as a um, uh, project, sci project scientist for the next uh, or the recently competed uh, Clips Lander. Oh, okay. So he, so he, he would be a good. Hasn't come all the way back to Earth yet, but at least come pretty close coming to the moon. All right. I'm wondering what y'all think about this. I could imagine, and then we can move on from the planet specific stuff. One thing that planet might actually be able to do if, you know, if we could make the business case for it is doing our trick of like deploying a large number of replicated small payloads in one of these big Mars landings. Like you could imagine deploying, you know, a hundred helicopters or a hundred little rovers or something where you can build them at scale, send them all out. If a bunch of them fail, you don't really care. And they bring a massive amount of data and it's kind of a distributed picture. Uh, so anyway, just an idea um, for this payload question. Don't have to develop a ton of new instruments. You can just send the same instruments out to a ton of places. We anyway. have two hand raises from Micah and Jonathan. All right, let's do them in that order. Micah and then Jonathan. Uh, so just a quick question. We were talking about um, Difficulty in filling a payload to Mars. Is that assuming it's a one-way trip and there's no ability to bring anything back? Well, I mean, sample return has its own, you know, obviously you don't get as much bang for the buck in terms of mass if you have to also have a thing that returns. But, you know, sample return is not going to be 100 tons, right? And so... so well, can I, so, so actually, I, I think the challenge is kind of independent of, of whether it's a one-way trip or a, a, a sample return because we actually looked at doing a sample return with the Red Dragon capsule. And it gets easier, uh, you know, again, because you have more, uh, more mass capacity to, to do it with. We, you know, we, we pretty much convinced ourselves you could probably do it with uh, a, a reduced number of launches. Um, so it's, I, I, I think the, the, the problem or the solution is kind of, agnostic as to whether it's one way or two way. If I recall correctly, the Red Dragon sample return was a one launch to Mars that takes the sample return vehicle. I'm not quite sure how it gets its samples, but it, it carries the return vehicle. And then there's another launch of a smaller system to fetch the return vehicle from Earth orbit. Right. That's right. That was, that was our final design. Yeah. And, and so, that was, uh, you know, essentially a single launch sample return and actually if you're willing to do what the actual sample return is doing, which is direct entry to earth and, and, uh, parachute the sample to the surface, you can do it without even that second, uh, fetch. Cool. Absolutely. Yeah. The second fetch was again, a planetary protection play, wasn't it? Most right. Yes. For, for the earth end of it. Yeah. Did it, did it change the, uh, return payload like earth orbit rendezvous? Is that a Delta V beneficial step? Um, I, I, I'm trying to recall, I, I, I think, I, I think we never conversed specifically on whether you would do a direct entry or, uh, Earth orbit rendezvous, because one of those approaches is obviously simpler in, in that it requires fewer moving parts. But on the other hand, there's the issue of, well, is, is it actually riskier from a planetary protection standpoint out at Earth? And, you know, we, does it, does it reduce the overall probability of, you know, accidentally contaminating, back contaminating Earth? And, and we never 
could get a definitive reading yeah. from the planetary protection community on which would be more. By the way, we already fetched some stuff from a comet and contaminated Earth with it, if I recall correctly, because it didn't land correctly in Utah. But that's another uh, another conversation. Jonathan, so, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, the, uh, just on, on that one, I mean, this challenge of uh, the launch cost becoming trivial compared to the spacecraft development cost is one that if Starship is successful, is going to affect all of space. And it's going to be solved first in the Earth orbit uh, satellite uh, regime, right? And it's going to require, I mean, since Sputnik, everyone's been like, shave a gram here, shave a gram there. And that's, you know, you've got to rethink totally, uh, you know, how you build satellites. Yeah. And, and so I think that's, uh, you know, you, the, the, the Mars thing will follow once, once the Earth, you know, once the aerospace industry is retooled you know, in that way. Um, uh, the question of, you know, what is planet's special source and, and how does it apply to the interplanetary regime, right? Where you have, you're, you're great at doing big constellations of small things, as was mentioned. You're great at doing high data rate uh, uh, data download. Um, the obvious thing for me is, is some, is, is in the, uh, asteroid surveying sphere, uh, send out a constellation of CubeSats to do spectroscopy. Of okay. Well, look, with that, having said that, we'll have to, uh, get something going on asteroids, uh, for a future meeting of this okay, group. Fine. And then I, Micah, I'm sorry, we bypassed you. So please go for it. That's fine. <laughs> Um, so the reason I asked about the return is I, I feel like if you can, if you can successfully go to Mars, pick something up and bring it back, I feel like once people know that that's possible, and if we ignore the environmental protection stuff, um, then you suddenly have, I think, no problem. I don't think you'll have any problem finding people who want to go get stuff off of Mars or go do something on Mars and then bring it back here. Um, I think this is one of those situations where it's the, you have two problems. One, the regulatory constraints that you mentioned. And two, the chicken and the egg, right? No one's going to bother developing or mentioning the things they want from Mars until after you have a way to do it. And then all of a sudden, you'll have an explosion of things people want. And the same thing that happened with computers and AI and everything else. No one knew what they wanted from computers until we had computers. And then all of a sudden, we need computers for everything in the world. And I feel like you'll run into the same problem or same solution once you actually can show you can go to Mars, drop something off, do some work, pick it back up, and bring it back. All right. Well, great. Now I want to go back and have another question for Tanya and anyone else who does planetary science on Mars. Um, uh, how can I say this? Um, what about that water and that ice that was found by that, that was it Phoenix, the polar lander? I can't remember which one. Yeah. Um, Phoenix was the polar lander. Yeah. So like, I always thought that was amazing and super important and kind of underappreciated. Is that a real thing? Did that do really condense on the legs of that lander and we saw it and then it evaporated? And is that important from a planetary uh, science and perhaps even an exobiology point of view? So um, you, we have to <clears throat> recognize that, <clears throat> yes, it was real. <clears throat> Sorry. Yes, it was real uh, that there were, that we uh, landed on an ice bed. Um, I mean, I was part of that mission, so I know I know what happened. I was there in operations for the whole thing. We landed on uh, a ice bed that was covered with soil. Um, the descent engines blew the soil away, and the ice bed was revealed. The descent engines also um, were hot, and they they blew a lot of ice up into vapor, which condensed on the lander legs. Um, and imaging from a camera, which was the robotic arm camera, looking under the lander to actually verify that the landing was safe, saw that there was a big, you know, scoured out uh, light colored patch. It was a black and white camera, so you couldn't really tell what color it was, but it was lighter colored than expected. And there were things on the lander leg. Um, those things were blobs, and over time, those blobs moved. Now, the interpretation was they were liquid, um, <clears throat> but the camera resolution was very poor, and they very well might have been ice. 
uh, <clears throat> again, condensed from this big, you know, flux of water vapor that came from the descent engine scouring out <clears throat> um, the uh, ice. Allison, could you please enable screen share for me? Thanks. All so, right. Um, <clears throat> but that is a, a disturbance that is not a natural disturbance. <clears throat> you can't say that, you know, because you um, artificially and instantaneously created lot, uh, water that, um, or, you know, liquid water, even if it was created, and I'm not convinced that it was created as liquid, um, that that actually means that there is a habitable environment there. So okay. there, there may very well be a habitable environment in that ice, but it is not happening in the current epoch because in, in the current epoch, Mars is particularly cold. Right. Modulo any possible geothermal springs or something like that. No, it isn't geothermal. It's the, the obliquity, the, the tilt of the Mars axis changes over time. And it, that those changes occur pretty rapidly. No, no. What I mean, when, what I mean is a that million years ago, it was 35 degrees. Now it's 25 degrees. And right. But what I mean is that if there's big continent sized sheets of ice under place, certain places on Mars, as there appears to be multiple lines of evidence that there might be. And if there's any sort of localized geothermal hotspot, then you might have liquid water and it might be a different game, right? Yes. Okay. So here's, here's some of this ice that Phoenix's little scooper uh, found evidence when it scooped. And then here is, um, here's, um, here. The blobs. Yeah. And so this wasn't created by the, by the engine plume, was it? This has happened like a long time later, didn't it? No, it, it happened uh, very quickly after the um, landing. Uh -huh. and, and then what happened is those, as you can see from this is a sequence of images, those blobs moved over time. Okay. So, um, but again, the, the more likely explanation for that is that it is c condensation on the lander legs of ice from the uh, fact that there is this big flux of water vapor uh, created by the landing itself. Oh, so are you saying that the water vapor was created by the rocket plume? Or I mean, that like a yes. plume or just the heat came from the plume and then the water uh, evaporated from the ice? The heat came from the plume um, <clears throat> and the water evaporated from the ice and some of it condensed on the lander legs. And then over time, those illuminated by sunlight, because again, this is the, near the North Pole. The sunlight is coming from, you know, very low angles. So under the lander, we get a lot of sunlight. And so, those heated so up did, enough to slide around. So did we never see any recondensation after the landing on those legs? Did we check? Well, we had no way to check. I mean, what, what we could see is that the blobs moved around. Well, what do you mean we had no way to check? Couldn't we just look at the same place three months later and see if that's that... what we did? Oh, that's how we see that the blobs moved around. Oh, I see. Okay. Got it. Well, all right. That suggests some interesting experiments that might be done with future missions. Okay. Next, um, next, uh, uh, next question for all you Mars heads. Um, did, uh, the Viking experiments, what? How likely or unlikely do you think it is that there's life on Mars based just on the Viking lander results from the seventies, whenever it was? Again, this is something I'm relatively familiar with because I was actually a grad student during the seventies when Viking landed on Mars. <clears throat> um, I think they uh, did not provide any useful information about whether there's <clears throat> life on Mars or not. Um, <clears throat> there were, the <clears throat> results were very ambiguous. The, uh, there were three Viking biology experiments. One of the three was fully consistent with a biological explanation, but more consistent with a chemical, uh, <clears throat> a chemical reaction, just in terms of its um, kinetics. Okay, so your, your colleague, Chris McKay differs, does he not? No. Oh. No. So the, the PI of that experiment, who actually passed away two years ago, 
is a guy named Gil Levin. And he, at, up until the time of his death, uh, claimed and advocated that he had found extant life on Mars with his instrument. The two other instruments also found reactive soil and that the interpretation, which is probably the correct interpretation, was that the soil had uh, loosely bound reactants and oxidants, which reacted with organic compounds that were poured into the soil in an attempt to culture. It was a culturing, all of three of them were culturing experiments, attempting to measure metabolism by culturing methods. And those methods are very difficult to get to work in uh, extreme environments on earth. And, um, but they, they created very rapid reactions. As soon as the organics were introduced into the soil, there was like almost an explosive reaction in all three instruments. And, um, and the, the uh, organics were delivered to the soil in fluids, in water. Um, so it's like you poured chicken soup on the soil and a bunch of things happened really fast. So um, it's, it was interesting. It was very interesting experiments. Uh, it's unlikely that from the locations where Viking landed on Mars, the near surface environment, which is very highly irradiated with ultraviolet and extremely cold and dry, it's very unlikely that there is extant life just waiting for somebody to pour chicken soup on it. So for that reason, I think- isn't that, isn't that what they did in the Viking was pour chicken soup almost literally? Yes. You know, not, it wasn't chicken soup, but it was, you know, the kind of thing you would culture microbes in because it was a microbe culturing experiment. Uh, okay, let's see. Steve Jurvetson just said something very interesting, which is that he has, at his office, which is, just, I don't know if he's going to get it or what, but he has a complete, he has a, he has a great collection of space. Uh, Showing it now. Like maybe Steve could just speak to this. If I'll, sure. I'll, do, yeah. I'll do the screen share. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get it to be big. Uh, oh. but that's the top of the instrument. Ooh. Wait, wait, it wait. Popped up. It's the only complete unit. Oh, I heard. And no, that's all in there. If you can see the gold part, that's popped up so you can see, you know, the GCMS and the other three experiments are all in there. It's incredibly beautiful. Is that uh, the Viking? That's yeah. the Viking payload? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the VLBI. Wow. The only one on earth. Um, it has, throw it back a little bit, you know, it's sort of the electronics package, all of the materials, the end of stuff in here. I, I can't see what you're seeing, but hopefully I'm pointing the right place. Yeah. Let me drop in here. But this is where, you know, it's heated up and, you know, ruined the GCMS results because of the perchlorates. Also, I have the separate GCMS unit that, uh, you know, was used elsewhere in the Viking lander. I think there were three GCMSs in total, um, on Viking and, uh, I've been doing research on them and yeah, so there they are. <laughs> so I will show it to all while we're mentioning it. Oh. <laughs> well, the, whole, well, the whole office is a space museum, as you can see for an option. There we go. So this is also from your office, just a closer view, Steve. Oh, that, well, that was just the link, but I was, if you want to go back and, I, and it has a whole bunch of information on it, but if you oh. go back to the live view of my screen, is that possible? Or? Yeah. Well, I can't do that. I can't, I don't know how to blow up your screen. Okay, no Can you, but. Uh, for our screen, I, I, we, we're seeing your screen great. Oh, you do? Oh, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, it's, it's full, neat. full of space stuff. And maybe I'll end just with one relevant. This is Mars. Um, and it actually has trapped, uh, atmospheric air bubbles inside, which were, you know, sampled and shown to be Martian atmosphere, um, agreeing of course, with the isotope oxygen, oxygen fractionation lines and other ways they prove Mars. It looks exactly like what you see on Mars. Got to go. Yeah. Look yeah. The planetary protection implications of him. Yeah. Just, I mean, I'm sneezing on it, you know, I'm <laughs> rubbing it in my nose. I, I, you know, yeah, I think I got the Andromeda strain early on. Maybe, maybe a, Steve, maybe we should schedule Steve to do it like a whole tour of his uh, museum on one of these future calls. That sure. would be oh, I'd love to see that. Um, <laughs> raise my hand <laughs> both all right that. all right we'll try and make that happen i know you're busy steve but you know by the way steve i have to call you i need to i need like 10 minutes of your time but that's a separate matter i'm just warning you um okay so let's see where are we we are uh, approaching the hour is the hour off allison we still have a few minutes and john has a question for tanya um tanya have the needs of the users in the research and educational program driven planet to do things differently than previously for example, altered the spacecraft or led to developing new interfaces for interacting with the data. 
Um, we've certainly done like R and D work with people that have used our data through the program, um, both on like the imagery side and the tech development side, like putting things on payloads kind of as tests or letting folks use different pieces of data other than the imagery to do work. Um, like we had some folks that were doing stuff with our magnetic field data at some point. I don't know if they're still working on that. Um, we also, okay, cool. Um, we've also had folks uh, like give input when we went from four bands to eight bands on, you know, like what bands would be useful for you that we don't currently have. Um, of course, the one everybody asks about is Sphere, which we which we don't have. We, we cannot put the near infrared, but it's kind of oh, hard to get. We're about to have it with Fidelity. But yeah, I, 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 I mean, just for the doves in this, yeah. in this uh, case. So a couple dove, things but, on that. One is we're launching, we're, we just had critical design with these. We'll be launching a constellation of hyperspectral satellites, which are very high uh, finesse, if you will. And they go deep in, they go well into the shortwave infrared and they have some um, five nanometer bandwidth all the way from blue to shortwave infrared. And although- Shortwave the, being what? What's your launch wavelength? 2.5 uh, microns. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. So, and it's one detector that goes all the way from blue, from 400 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers. And it's um, all beautifully co-registered. It's JPL payload, by the way, but which they're transferring the technology to us so we can build uh, the constellation. They're building the first payload, we're building the bus, and then the second through sixth or whatever payloads we are building. And uh, this will be, this has a whole number of uses. It's a whole other conversation which we don't have time for, but it will be hyperspectral and it will have a huge amount of science uh, implications. One thing I want to do, and I know I don't want to make this too planet centric, but I do want to say, uh, I, I think Tanya would probably agree that where, where the science users have really affected planets, not so much in our technology or our, you know, software interfaces. I mean, it's a lot of users, so they do presumably generate a lot of bug reports and stuff, but, um, but in our programmatics, like this, we did not know when we started this company that we were going to have thousands or hundreds of science users. We thought we were going to have a few big users and that was it. And the big users kind of drive our policy for obviously bottom line reasons, like the big users are the big money. But, but what the science users have done is, you know, not only given us a lot of input and as I said, bug reports and stuff like that. And not only have they changed our programs where we now have several full-time people devoted to supporting these science users. And not only have they generated all these publications, which we like because we get to show off the fact that people are using our data and publishing all the time, but, um, and this is something which might happen more, hopefully will happen more as time goes on. A lot of these users make very sophisticated algorithms. Like they make stuff to do all this machine learning to find whatever they're looking for, forests growing and shrinking or lakes growing and shrinking or whatever it might be. And ideally we will be able to use some of that technology and some of those people even to fold back into our company to create actual commercial products where relevant. So anyway. We've done that already, right? With our Planet Fusion product. So yeah, we had a, point. yeah, there was a researcher, Rasmus Holberg, who at the time, I forget if he was at San Diego State or King Abdullah, because he worked at both. Um, he developed this technique to fuse the planet scope, the, the Dove imagery with Sentinel-2 and Landsat to create cloud-free, gap-free uh, time series over agricultural areas. And this was so groundbreaking at the time. Um, the head of our education and research program was like, we need to hire this person. Like, so now he's our lead engineer of this product, which planet has called Fusion. Um, and which and, we sell. Yeah, and we sell it. Uh, we have a team of people that work under the Sky Rasmus to develop it, all out of giving the data away for free to Rasmus through this education research program. And so like part of my role now is like, okay, how many other fusions are hiding out there in the literature or you know, what people around the world are doing really cool things with our data where we might want to collaborate with them or straight up hire them. All right. So uh, Allison, we're at the hour. Uh, what do you want to do? Well, usually what I always uh, love to end these meetings with is the standard question of like, you know, if there's one challenge that you'd love to see solved to advance your field, something, you know, let's say for young people entering the space that are just like the space space that are new uh, to take on. What would that be? You know, if you want to like inspire young minds to work on something like the problem that you want to see solved, uh, then this is uh, a great place to share. Oh man, that's such a big question. 
I, it sounds kind of like a boring answer, but I think uh, developing more infrastructure so we can send back more data from deep space missions. We can already take like an order of magnitude more data than we're able to send back with mission with missions like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and that mission has been at Mars since 2006. So if we could actually, you know, expand the deep space network, set up optical comm systems, like get real, like massive amounts of data back from places other than the Earth and the Moon, that would be really this, interesting. By the way, it, it's an interesting, suggests to me an interesting tie-in, which is if we do have a lot more payload capacity in terms of mass and volume coming online for cheap, then we could imagine sending spacecraft with larger solar arrays and more powerful radios and lasers and get back a lot more data kind of in the brute force way just be, by throwing more mass at it definitely but even on the ground here like the space network is so poorly uh resourced at this point like i, I remember when we shifted marsh constance orbiter from like the primary mission phase where we got to use the 70 meter dishes to the extended mission phase where we got relegated to 34 meter dishes the amount of data that you can send back just drops so much and it's really depressing because it used to be like oh mars is really close around the 70 meter dishes we could take 500 images a day with ctx and then you get relegated to the smaller dishes and you go out toward like well, conjunction you yeah, take four I pictures a day answer there also is of course going to uh, shorter wavelengths higher frequencies even if it's not optical like k band or something because your link budget i.e the amount of data you can transmit back and your antenna size requirements dramatically decrease as you go to uh, higher frequency radio which is a lot more affordable now than it was in 2006. um okay look allison uh there we got that last answer um we're gonna have to uh, prep people in the future that they're going to have to answer this question because it usually requires some thought. Um, all right. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, tell all your friends who are interested in space, cause we can definitely handle a bigger audience in this group. And, uh, if you have, know of anyone besides say Steve, who, um, should, uh, be a speaker, do let, uh, Allison know, uh, and we'll, 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 uh, schedule that up.